Now, probability really starts with the notion of an experiment. What I mean is any process that produces an outcome that is not known in advance. Now, this experiment has a set of possible outcomes. We'll denote that set with the capital letter omega. So this set of, uh, of possible outcomes is what we'll call the sample space. We'll, we'll think of this set B as the collection of subsets of omega, collection of subsets of the sample space, what we're going to call the set of events, or the Borel sets. Now each event is really just a set of possible outcomes in the sample space, but we're going to define probabilities for events. With this, we can define a probability. Now this probability is, what is going to take every, every event in this set of events and assign to it a number between 0 and 1. And it's going to be called a probability if it satisfies three conditions. First, the probability of the event containing the entire sample space. Well, that probability is 1. Any set uh, is going to have a probability of less than 1. We have a sequence of, of events in the set of events, and they are disjoint. That is, that there's no intersection between any of these, uh, any of these sets. Then, what happens is, if we take the countable union of them and form that set, take the probability of that, that has to be equal to the sum of the probabilities. For some additional clarity, I wrote these three conditions for being a probability um, up at the top of the board here, so we can see them more clearly. And I labeled them as the Kolmogorov axioms. These are three axioms that are necessary and sufficient for P to be a probability. They imply everything that we think intuitively holds about probabilities. In particular, they imply the following three and a half conditions. That is, probabilities not only have to be less than one, but they have to be bigger than zero. Uh, if we think about the event of A not happening, that is A complement, we think about its probability, that's one minus the probability that A happens. The next one is the probability of nothing happening, nothing occurring in the sample space. Well, that's zero. After all, we ran the experiment, so something ought to happen. If A is a subset of B, then the probability of A is at least weakly less than the probability of B. Now, in addition to these six conditions that we get here, we can get a couple more. The first result here is that we can get a more general formula here, if, even if A intersect B, even if A and B share, no, or share some elements in common in the original sample space. What we can see is that the general formula for A or B happening is the probability of A plus the probability of B, minus the probability of A and B. We can see this in a simple Venn diagram. If we want to know the probability of A or B occurring, we want to think about the probability being sort of this area uh, that is uh, enclosed by these two circles. And what we can see is that if we get A, count A, and we count B, we're double counting the area where A and B both occur. So we need to subtract that out. That's a Venn diagram proof of this. And if you wanted to think about uh, getting a formula for the probability of B and not A, you could do a similar diagram, and I invite you to give, give that one a shot. Now, there are many other inequalities that you can get just simply by applying set theory and logic and working with these probabilities and these eight results that we started with. But I've written down a couple more inequalities here just because they're useful and famous and you ought to know them if you're going to study probability. This first one here, uh, the probability of A and B has to be bigger than the probability of A plus B minus 1. That one's called Bonferroni's inequality, and number 10 here is what is known as Boole's inequality. If you take, the, uh, if you take any sequence of sets in this Borel set, and you take the countably infinite union of these, that probability of that event that's created by that 
union of those uh, those events has to be less than if you just added up each of uh, the probabilities of each of those events separately. And that's what's known as Boole's inequality. Now, the typical way that we want to think about it, the frequentest way to think about uh, probabilities, is that probability is the long-run frequency of occurrence. So if you flipped a coin once, the sample space there would be either heads or tails. Let's say the event is tails, and we ask ourselves, well, how, how many times does tails come up in this uh, over and over and over again in the same conditions? Uh, what we can do is we can say that that is what we mean by the probability. And if this is a fair coin, you're going to think that the, uh, that the probability of tails is going to be one half. That if we kept flipping a coin over and over and over again, it might not always be, like if we stop at any point in the sequence, it's probably not going to be exactly one half. But we expect that over time, it's going to get closer and closer to one half. And so that's going to be our notion of probability. But that previous discussion that we had about what, the, what a probability is. Well, P is a probability just so long as it satisfies those three axioms. It doesn't have to be this long-run frequency interpretation. In fact, it could be something very subjective. Something very subjective would be three-fifths. It would be sort of nonsensical, it doesn't match with the world, but that could be a probability model, a subjective, someone who has subjective probabilities that are just wrong. And this probability model, this way of thinking about probability, allows us to think about how probabilities would work, even if someone was subjective and wrong in a frequentist sense. But let's do a second example. This example is just to get a better sense for how these sample spaces work and how to define probabilities on them. Now let's imagine that the experiment is that a couple has two children and we observe the gender of each of the ch children and the order in which this happens. Well, it would have four elements. It would have a boy and then a boy, a boy and then a girl, a girl and then a boy, and then two girls. Um, we would think that each one of these would be equally likely. So let's think about the event A as at least one boy. Now, the event A being at least one boy would include three out of the four elements of the sample space. And with knowledge of probabilities on this original sample space, we can figure out the probability of an event like A. According to our axiom, we can just go ahead and add them, and then we can get the probability of three-fourths. This example can actually be extended. But to extend it, we need to think about a different notion of probability, in particular, conditional probability. Conditional probability is a probability of one set given that the other, that the other event actually occurred. We denote it as probability A given B, where B is the event that we know occurs, but we're wondering whether A actually occurred. We can actually compute this by definition as the probability that A and B happened divided by the probability that B occurred. Let's, let's just keep event A the same and define B to be there is at least one girl. A intersect B equals BG and GB. We can go ahead and compute this probability. Now, the probability that A intersect B, well, that's just going to be one half. And the probability that B occurs, that is, that there's at least one girl, well, let's count the elements, and these are all equally likely. At least one girl has BG, GB, and GG. So that's three-fourths. Invert and multiply, and we will get two-thirds. And so this conditional probability, probability that there's at least one boy, given that there's at least one girl, is going to be two-thirds. And so now you have a sense for what probability is and what a conditional probability is. And in particular, uh, you have a really good sense for uh, how probability works in general.